Okay, the second speaker this morning is Julian Goodwin. He's a networking engineer at Google in Sydney, one of those funny offices I've been to a couple of times. Uh, in his past, he's worked as assistant in on educational networks and in small businesses. He's spoken at several conferences previously at an OSDC in 2013. Julian. Good morning. So, please do ask questions. This is going to be another one of those fairly quick run-through talks. And if I hit upon something that's interesting to you, a problem you're encountering, something you didn't know about, please do just interject is fine, stick your hand up, whatever works. Um, that is how you'll get the best out of this. So before we actually get on the network side, there's some bad assumptions. And Ben touched on these in the, in the previous talk. Yeah, people listening. OK, let's, let's ignore the whole large government surveillance thing. Has anybody run um, upside down to net Wi-Fi sniffers at a coffee shop? Yeah, it's kind of fun occasionally. People do listen. And as Ben mentioned, if I've got an automated script running, I don't care if you're one machine or 10 million. I'm going to run the whole internet. It's really easy these days to scrape the entire internet. There are multiple education, um, multiple university research groups that do multiple port scans of the entire publicly reachable internet every day. Or IPv4 internet, of course. Um, IPv6 would be much harder. But they're not. Corporate networks are actually pretty horrible places. There's usually the ancient printer that got pwned five years ago that's still there doing evil things. Most corporate networks are actually worse than many well-run service providers. And there's still people going, encryption's expensive. It's not. Encryption is computationally cheap. There are ways to deploy it that are essentially free. I am reminded, though, of Jerry Kimball's talk in the last year, why encryption won't save you. Yes. So encryption alone doesn't save you. There's, you have to deploy it right. You have to have reasonable key management. And that is hard. The computational cost is trivial. The management cost may not be. Absolutely valid. So again, before we even get to thinking about networks, we really need to think about how we store and transport data. If it's on a disk, if it's on a tape, if it's on a Blu-ray, if it's on a USB key, really should be encrypted. Probably at multiple levels. There is actual sense in using device level encryption if the device has it. Then using file system encryption so that way you don't have to trust the device. And then if you use a service that actually does do encrypted storage sensibly, use that as well. This way your storage admins don't need to have ac or in fact they can't have access to user data. And that's valuable. It means fewer ways to screw up. The multiple layer of encryption. If you screw up, you've still got some fallbacks. And don't forget about your backups. The amount of company has leaked sensitive data by way of, oops, the backup tape was in someone's car that got nicked. We haven't had any of those very visible lately, but it used to be about a couple of times a year. Some either large, pub, large organization, hospital, etc would have backup tapes go missing or stolen, and hey, we didn't encrypt them, because oops. Um, and there are these things called encrypted databases. They're actually generally not great, because they're encrypted databases, except very large chunks of things you can't encrypt in them. Essentially, anything you actually ever want to do database functionality on, you can't encrypt. So they're not actually all that valuable. Um, there are databases that are system level encrypted, and that's usable. But databases that go for cell level encryption, I would be wary of. Transport. 
Very simple rule. Don't let clear text on a wire. Um, whether you consider a colo or a rack secure is a matter of perspective. Um, good colos are perfectly fine and they will let you audit. They will seek your approval before their contractors go in for aircon work or UPS work. Bad ones are not. Who is good, who is bad? That nah, changes with management. This really could be switched to all data going over the internet, but very quickly the line of what is internet, what is your corporate network, what is your data center network, pretty blurry. So, okay, this is all, we care about this because we're handling sensitive information. Why are we doing that? If you don't actually need it, don't get it. You don't need to know my mother's maiden name. Do you even need to know me at all? Can you authenticate me using another service? Now, if you're a public general internet service, that might mean authenticate with Facebook, and it's reasonable you might not want to do that. Authenticate with OpenID, which is great, now that a large number of providers are shutting down OpenID services. There are downsides. Inside a corporate network, a good SSO system is wonderful. Don't store it. If you have to take sensitive information, but you don't need to store it, don't. Outsource it. Um, I, I have friends that run payment processes. There is no way on earth I'd implement my own payment processing these days. I'd use them, I'd use PayPal, I'd use other companies, because the management and dealing with PCI, the cost of taking those cards is a lot more than the processing fees. Sure, I can do something that'll work well enough. I'm pretty sure I could write something that wouldn't get me done in. But, and hey, I could probably talk an auditor around. Or I can just outsource it, not have that problem. And it's not that problem. Now, it is worth pointing out, if you do outsource credit card processing, you are still liable for some parts of the payment security stuff. You should be talking with your banks, you et cetera, et cetera. Um, Outsourcing it is not magic in the, for payment card, it is for other systems. But at least, if you do ultimately have to request it and store it, isolate it. Keep that level of sensitive information on separate systems. Keep your payment servers separate to everything else. In PCI terms, this means your main servers would not be in the, in the covered part of your network. Sorry, your payment servers would only be in the covered part of the network. Your normal web servers would not be. Keep them separate, and then you can lock them down. Because you have much more restrictive sets of data, it's actually feasible to go, these servers really should only be talking to these three things at about this data rate. And you give it a bit of slop, but it's actually feasible to go, this is likely, this is bad. Um, for those of you that saw it, this is what how LastPass was able to identify, we think there might have been a problem, because we saw unusual data patterns. Nothing proves that there is, but it's unusual. We can't legitimately track it. We're going to assume we've been done, even though, we're, even though there's no evidence for that, other than this weird things. Um, and please don't ask for secure questions. Um, Paul had a great rant about this earlier this week. They're a really, really bad idea. At Best what I'm going to do is dump in a bunch of random data, maybe actually make a note of that random data. But sadly, that then means there's a very good chance that if I call your support and they go, well, what was your secure question? Stuffed if I know, but it was probably like 30 characters of random. They go, yeah, that looks like 30 characters of random. There you go, you're secured. So if... Mm. So, so that's probably a much better choice for secure for secure questions that it's like there's a decent chance could be social engineered over the phone um, because sadly, yeah, 20, 30 characters are random. You call up support, you go, I don't know, it was 20, 30 characters are random. Support are likely to go, yeah, whatever. Um, if you're lucky, they at least go, well, 
I'll reset it, but it's going to your email address anyway, so clearly you're fine. Which is ultimately why they're, they're largely worthless since they can often be worked around. So if you're going to have passwords, deal with them, use algorithms designed for passwords, uh, bcrypt, pkbdf2, per system and per user salt, per system salt's not in the database. Um, again, this is a case where you probably don't want to do it yourself. You want to find an actual good authentication system and use that. There are SSO systems out there that you can use in the field. I'm pretty certain every single option ever invented sucks horribly. I've yet to see one that doesn't. But they, they do work and they do at least mean you have one spot to care about. And don't use the passwords input to other systems. Uh, we saw this with Ashley Madison recently where the reason they were able to crack a whole lot of the passwords we, was because the password was also lowercase, then used as a part of an input to an MD5 hash. That meant you crack the MD5, which was actually considerably easier, especially since it was lowercase, and then you just do case randomization on the actually well-encrypted passwords, and bingo, you're done. So keep passwords alone. Don't put them in session cookies. And yeah, please don't use secret questions, password hints. Um, with Adobe, I think it was last year, that was the way about half of their passwords were cracked, was because people used a hint of password is foo. And if you didn't do that, but someone else who shared the same password as you did, that was also cracked because there was no per user assault. And of course, brute force attacks are still possible. All this does is make it harder. And yes, if you are a small, if you're a small enough target, it means that they might run a common dictionary over your passwords and your phone. And anyone who uses a good password is fine. If you're a large target, they might still do a per user brute force. They might look for interesting people, brute force them. But if you do things, if you use good, proper algorithms and passwords with individual random salt, the end result is actually brute forcing it. Brute forcing the entire tree is not feasible. Networks. So. There's, there's reasonable arguments in many perspectives. I personally just use Debian's PWGen and pump it enough characters, and that realistically will work. Um, although for people who do use it, Debian's PWGen has a skewed random number generator. Um, it, because of the way it filters characters to be readable, it ended up skewed. So use a long password, but hey, you're storing it in a last pass or at least somewhere. You should, I mean, you should only be remembering a couple of passwords and use a last pass, as a consumer, use a last pass, use something like that. Um, everywhere I've worked has had a shared password vault for operations. And so in my last job, it was just a GPG t encrypted text file and we dumped it in CVS. My current job, it's something much more advanced because we're a much, much, much larger ops group than a couple of people that could fit around a table. So, firewalls. Stateful firewalls are a really, really bad thing to put in front of servers because they are a lovely choke point and really easy to knock off a network. Stateless ACLs can do everything you actually need of a firewall. You also want to try and prevent IP address spoofing, which is when you send a packet to someone other than you are. Stateful firewalls do not do this automatically, by and large. If you're going to use stateful firewalls, at least don't add intrusion detection, anti-malware. Again, it just slows you down and, hey, all your traffic's encrypted. What purpose is 
looking at, oh, that encrypted number looks nothing like this unencrypted problem. Most regulations don't actually require stateful firewalls. They require that you demonstrate you have isolation. You can do this with stateless ACLs. It might be easy to use stateful firewalls and sure, if if you're on a um, if you're in Australia and a smaller provider, a ten thousand um, dollar Cisco ASA Juniper SRX will have big enough state tables that you've got far far bigger problems with your internet being dosed before you run out of state. For those of us who run larger sites, it's it, it moves from being uh, attractive target to just plain not feasible. So going along the firewalls are uh, the wonder of NATs. They're not a security measure. They're a workaround in corporate networks for bad design. Until, uh, depending on where you are in the world, two years ago to last month, IPv4 addresses were still available by going to the local registries and going, here, give me some. It was not hard. It, if you were paying the, f the full member fees, $10,000 a year bought you many tens of thousands. This, it was never a problem getting IP addresses. People who, who didn't do that. Now, there's nothing wrong with using private IP addresses for your printers that should never be on the internet because there's a print server that will proxy to them. Nothing wrong with that. But any time a NAT is there, think about what purpose it is. These days, yes, it might well be because we have no public IPv4 addresses and we need service. Yeah, so interestingly, NAT gives you non-routability. There's ways around that in most cases. The NAT, the, the NAT part of the logic is usually pretty dumb and simple um, and can be made to pass traffic. It shouldn't. But, yeah, some can even be made... Some will even happily let you ingress packets to, destined for completely nonsensical addresses. Now, getting packets to them... That should be harder. Hopefully, if you've got a good upstream provider, they're doing the disverification. Um, traversal. So, NAT traversal is getting inbound traffic through a NAT. This is sort of demonstrating the whole point that things don't work. Um, so, you can do this with assistance from the NAT system. UPnP, which is Microsoft standard for this, can do it automatically and will, in fact, without uh, user input, open, port, open holes in the NAT towards a particular device. Um, the implementation of UPnP on many devices is hilariously bad, and you can often send packets to the UPnP daemon on someone else's consumer NAT router and open ports on their network with no authentication. Sadly. Um, UDP. The common way UDP is implemented in NAT systems is simply I send a packet out on a particular port number. As long as there's no conflict, anyone on the internet send packets to the NAT address on that port will get me. Will get me. Uh, there's also a trick called TCP simultaneous open that I sus is not all that well known, but it is actually implied by the standards, which is when both sides of a TCP connection agree on port numbers, send their SINs at the same time, both ACK, and you end up with a connection opened by both sides. And you time it right, this works through NATs. Um, variations on these methods are how things like Skype work, where both sides are behind NATs. If one is behind one that's a little easier to get holes through, that's how this ends up working. It's yeah, I mean, this just, you shouldn't be assuming these things are security devices because they're not. So, 
I talked to her before about blocking and ACLs and things. One thing, please don't block. Don't block ICMP. So ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol. Um, if you've ever used ping, if you've ever used traceroute, all this relies on ICMP. If you're on IPv6, neighbor discovery, which is ARP for IPv6, relies on ICMP. So if you block it entirely, you're going to have a bad day. Um, something called PathMT, which I'll get to later, relies on ICMP. Ping relies on ICMP. Trace relies on ICMP. People block it because all no security implications. But broadly, I can replicate most of the things I can do with ICMP in other ways. They're just more painful. An attacker who's going to do it with automated systems doesn't care. People troubleshooting issues care. There is a side note, though. Um, people do a lot of going, oh, ping says there's loss, there's, therefore there's loss. ICMP loss might not be actual packet loss, um, even if it's not been ACL blocked. Uh, larger routers, and by larger I mean three, four man lift, takes up half a rack type devices, uh, rate limit ICMP because of the way they work. Because responding to ICMP means they can't do it in hardware, they have to send it to what is actually a pretty weak, weak little Intel or power CPU. They rate limit in hardware quite severely to prevent um, outages on that CPU. And there are some types of tunneling that are hidden from trash rat. So we talked about some background, and now, OK, let's, let's mention encryption, because it, it solves all known wonders. Please don't build your own encryption system. You will get it wrong. Even if you are a professional cryptographer, you will get it wrong. You just hopefully won't get it wrong as badly. There are standard implementations. Use them. Now, that said, OK, sure, we saw the OpenSSL bugs. We saw the one that was out last week. Lately, this last year and a half seems to be nothing but hilariously bad bugs in SSL implementations, or TLSs now. So you really should test it anyway. Test the certificate validation. See what happens if you get the host name wrong, the certificate chain wrong. Revocation. If you revoke a certificate, is it still accepted? Because it probably will be. Uh, data issue is an experience. Um, if you have embedded systems, this is one you might actually test, want to test it doesn't work. Because you're, if your embedded system has no clock, it might work when, you, when it boots now because it's been set to clock from build date, which was last week. What happens next year? When the certs are, say, are saying they're issued in 2017. And, yeah. And test for interception. What happens when you man in the middle of your test code? Now, this is one where you probably want to have a dev mode where this works, because it's really useful to intercept your traffic occasionally and know what's happening. But you also want to make sure this doesn't work in your release builds. So that's don't run a debugger on your public servers, and certainly don't leave it running. And if somebody tells you, shut it down quick whole bunch of useful tools there. Um, SSL Labs, probably most of you have tried it, looked at banks' websites and laughed at how badly they're configured. Um, it's a nice dashboard for public HTTPS websites. Um, TestSSL.sh is a shell script. It's essentially re-implementing SSL tests. Um, it's not as good at the advice, but it's very useful for proving my mail server is doing is sanely configured. My IMAP server is sanely configured. Or this server I have that's not connected to the internet, but I do need to care about its security, isn't still advertising SSL2 as its best protocol. Uh, no go to fail is a collection of tests. So what I s talked about before, testing the uh, certificate validation. This is a suite of tools for this. There are others. And um, MIT mProxy is a man-in-the-middle proxy, commonly used for development work. 
Again, it's the sort of thing you don't want this to work on your release builds, but it's really handy at times for it to work that way. Um, another option, of course, is if you're not using your, if everything's over HTTP and you're not using your own library, you can just have a dev server and dev host name that reflects in dev builds. And that way you don't even have to allow man in the middle normally. So client authentication. We mentioned before a little bit about passwords and that's one way to do it. It's sadly a really common way to do it. Many applications use static keys compiled into applications for various purposes. That's basically clear text. If, you're, if the application is going out on public app stores, any keys inside it, assume they're public. Um, this goes especially well for people who accidentally leave their AWS keys in their uh, Puppet, Chef, etc. configs and then upload those to GitHub in a public repo. Yes, generally, if they're in an expected format. So if you were smart and encoded your thing specially, they won't always get caught. Um, the same goes for, of course, private RSA key being a hilariously depressing search term. Um, again, GitHub blocks a lot of these these days, uh, but they're easy to find, sadly. And... If you're using TLS, client certificates actually work really well, except for the elephants, probably an understatement in the room, the many, many, many elephants in the room that is uh, client certificate management. There are ways to do this in browsers. Um, if you run, if this is an enterprise situation, you're running on a Microsoft implementation, Active Directory can issue device client certificates. This works really well because everything just works. And it's actually fairly reasonably secure. OK, so using HTTPS, using possibly something else built on TLS. Do you have any redirects that go via HTTP? Have you marked your cookies secure? Are there cookies that should be marked HTTP only and aren't? And of course, there are things more than the web. Set your mail servers up. But look, getting certificates was a pain. Was stupidly expensive for 128 bits of random numbers. Uh, for now, and I'm really annoyed I only discovered this like two months ago, there is a service called SSL Mate that is a console tool and will issue, you link it up to your account, it will issue certificates, it will charge you really quite cheap rates for certificates, they chain up through a proper route, they're good. But real soon now, and we are talking within a month, um, the a organization backed by the EFF and others will launch called Let's Encrypt and this will be free certificates. So. Honestly, unless you need it now, I would just wait. Um, once you have less to encrypt, there is essentially no justification for not putting everything through TLS with issued upstream certificates. Um, there are reasons you might want to run your own CA internally in an organization. So if you're still doing that, sure. There are reasons why you might want to use a histo an old commercial CA for your major website if you need to be accessed by people still running Windows XP. But for a lot of other things, Let's Encrypt solves that problem of, I don't really want to buy a certificate for this. Or, and this is especially true with things like mail servers where, well, I need a certificate because I'm not going to run IMAP without security, but I just run a self-signed. This is you no longer need to run self-signed certificates. So it, it hasn't launched yet. It will hopefully launch fairly soon, as I said, within a month. But it's looking promising. So there are also some new uh, application layer protocols that are helping out here. HTTP2, 
is now a standard. Um, what it was based on the Speedy protocol, which was developed by Google. Um, it's a new version of HTTP protocol. We're no longer HTTP 1.1. It is in practice always encrypted. There is an unencrypted version in the standard that's defined, but no browser implements it, nor is likely to. Um, Google and Mozilla have both stated we will not implement unencrypted. I think Microsoft are unlikely to at this point, merely because while they're getting pushback from customers, it's not strong enough. And it, it gives you a bunch of benefits. It gives you some compression of header data, which is surprisingly big if you've seen cookies these days. Uh, server push. For all that work people did with trying to make images into sprites and using CSS layout, now you can just push the images. And it's all multiplexed over a single connection, or at least you can multiplex more over a single connection. Um, the Where in HP 1.1, you might have given your images eight host names, so they hash across many connections. Now you don't need to do that. There's also a protocol called Quick, which is HTTP 2 over UDP transport. And it's kind of doing experiments with congestion control and more. It's a research project. If running over not TCP is interesting to you, look at it. It might be shiny, might not be. It is in public use, but I, I wouldn't put it into anything that isn't getting continual updates. Uh, GRPC is a really shiny thing. It's a generic protocol buffer based RPC system. Uh, protocol buffers is Google's standard serialization system. Uh, JSON, YAML, etc. But it's a binary representation. There's a million of them. Protocol buffers just happens to be the one Google uses. And here's a public RPC system based on. It's transported on top of HTTP2. The streams are slightly different, but it's just a HTTP stream. There's a website. You can learn more. OK, mobile enterprise networks. So oddly enough, enterprise networks and mobile networks share a lot of the same problems. They have far too many middle boxes. Intrusion detection prevention systems that don't really do a lot, especially on server networks. TCP optimization that usually doesn't. Too many firewalls. Uh, VPN appliances that do just weird things. There's a thing I mentioned earlier called PathMTU discovery. So some network transports don't use a 1500-byte MTU that Ethernet did classically. And in fact, Ethernet doesn't in some cases. So you use a system called PathMTU discovery to discover this problem, which basically it sends packets that might be too large and waits for the ICMP error message to know that it might be a problem. But if you black hole traffic, there's problems. Um, M2 black holes are common in broadband access networks, sadly. And ICMP filtering hurts as well. So there is a thing called TCP MSS clamping that will help here. Um, or for IPv6, the common workaround these days is you just run at the minimum guaranteed MTU of 1,280. There's also a thing called buffer bloat. And this is, of course, the shiny name given to an old problem. Um, I think they've got a logo as well, but yeah, whatever. So some networks buffer too much data. I, I think a lot of us will have been on a 3G connection, done a ping test of something, goes, why is this taking six seconds? to get me my data. So we call it buffer bloat now. And basically the problem is people are afraid of dropping packets. Usually I'd rather my packet be dropped than delivered five seconds later. And teaching people that is a pain. So there's something called the ICSI Netalyzer, which is a great tool to visualize your own connection. It does require Java. Uh, at Berkeley. Um, it will also detect some types of MTU issues. So we also have too many NATs. 
in some mobile networks, in a bunch of enterprise networks, there are NATs chained to NATs chained to NATs. This is what happens when you merge companies that both use 10 slash 8 IP space or 192.168 space. <sighs> they suck. There's a thing called carrier grade NAT. Uh, I don't recall if I've seen that in production anywhere. I have certainly seen people, I mean, it's quite common for mobile networks to steal uh, US or UK Department of Defense space because stealing IP addresses off people with nuclear weapons is a great idea. <laughs> so anyway, there's a thing called carrier grade NAT because ISPs don't have IPv4 addresses anymore. So they have to put really big NAT boxes in front of everything. This works about as well as you'd imagine. So it causes latency, it causes more path MTU issues, and it's got more state. State is what comes back to a lot of the hurt here. Um, carrier VPNs, for those of you in the enterprise world, MPLS VPNs are not encrypted, nor are most other types of VPNs used in carrier networks. They are tunneled. If done right, you shouldn't be able to inject traffic into them, or see traffic from them for that matter, but they're not encrypted. And even if they were, if the carrier has the keys, comes back to you really should assume it's plain text because most carriers can be coerced into handing things over pretty easily. All right. So as is required on any talk about networking for the last 20 years roughly, here's the section on IPv6. Um, luckily, the situation's actually pretty good. So LTE networks, IPv6 is actually really broadly deployed. And some are even not deploying v4. Uh, T-Mobile in the US, if you are on new enough devices, you do not get an IPv4 address. You use a tool like 464xlat or similar, which is essentially relying on DNS64 and NAT64. So when you connect to something you, that only has an IPv4 address, it will shove an extra prefix on the front till you connect to that, and you do. Um, Essentially, the magic in 464xlat is Skype and a couple of other systems which connect to addresses. And this essentially has your phone run a little daemon to help there. Apple, uh, now requiring your applications to run in a V6 only environment, but V6 only is with the same caveat as the above. You've got a translation layer. Um, you're able to work in NAT64, and that's fine. Uh, MacOS now has a test tool for this. It's actually not great because it's as though you were on a V6 unconnected network only. And many of the largest global consumer ISPs have V6. Sadly, in Australia, we're still talking internode and pretty much internode. Um, pretty much all the business providers will do V6. You might still have to ask them though. So why would you actually care? Look, it's still work. So you're unlikely to see NATs. Benefit there, easy troubleshooting. Fewer middle boxes messing with the traffic. Sometimes because they're not needed, sometimes because they don't work and people don't notice. There is a big latency win because of this. Uh, Facebook talked about their experience at scale. They were seeing about a 15% performance win on V6 only clients, on mobile networks. This is actual real today. And there really isn't any security benefit costs. IPSEC, you might have heard talked about in years ago. It got dropped as being acquired years ago. And it was available on v4 anyway. It has about the same bugger all adoption. There is potential for information leakage with automatic addressing in v6. Most systems these days use privacy addresses by default. And so that's not a problem. Uh, and we are at a time. So I was going to talk about GSLB and Anycast, which are ways of distributing traffic globally. You can come and find me for the rest of this week. I'll be here. And while the next week is setting up, any questions?
Anything else? All right, as I say, you're welcome to come and chat to me through the rest of this week, and I'll expound in slightly slower paced sentences. Okay. Julian, thanks for coming. Thanks for your talk. Here's a little memento. Thank you very much. Okay.